mean free path and collision frequency. In the video on the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution it was shown that the mean speed of the molecules of an ideal gas can be determined with the given formula. This formula can be used, for example, to estimate the mean speed of air molecules. Since 78% of air consists of nitrogen, the average speed of the nitrogen molecules is to be calculated. Such a nitrogen molecule has a mass of 4.65 times 10 to the power of minus 26 kilograms. At a room temperature of 293 Kelvin this results in a mean speed of about 470 meters per second. Thus, on average, the air particles move at supersonic speed. Due to the statistical distribution of the velocities, however, significantly higher speeds are also present. About 1% of the molecules have a speed of more than 1,000 meters per second. One molecule out of 1 billion even reaches a speed of 2,000 meters per second. If gas molecules generally have such high speeds, why is it that the fragrance of an open perfume bottle at the other end of a room is not immediately perceived, as one would expect at speeds of several hundred meters per second? Experience shows that it obviously takes some time for the fragrance to be noticed. This is because the gas molecules do not have a free path when they move. The molecules will permanently collide with other particles and change their direction of motion in a random way. The distance a molecule can travel on average without colliding with other molecules is called mean free path. In the present case, the relatively small mean free path prevents the molecules of the perfume from being perceived immediately. The fact that the fragrance is nevertheless perceived relatively quickly is mainly due to air currents, which carry the particles over greater distances. Note that convection is no longer a completely random motion. In this case, the molecules are carried along over macroscopic distances in a certain direction. In the following we want to determine the mean free path of the molecules of an ideal gas, considering the kinetic theory of gases. In order to determine the mean free path of a molecule, a gas consisting of only one type of particle is considered. The molecules are assumed to be spheres with a diameter d. If one now follows a molecule, it will collide with other molecules at irregular intervals. The average distance traveled between two successive collisions corresponds to the mean free path lambda. For the sake of simplicity, we first consider all other particles to be at rest. The molecule which we consider moves so to speak through an ocean of resting particles and changes its direction after every free path. A collision between the moving molecule and a resting particle will occur when the surfaces of the spherical particles touch each other. This will be the case if the distance of the centers of gravity is smaller than twice the radius of the molecules. Thus, a circular collision cross-section sigma perpendicular to the direction of motion can be defined around the center of gravity of the moving molecule, within which the center of gravity of the resting particle must lie for a collision to occur. The radius of this circular surface corresponds exactly to the diameter of the gas molecules. This collision cross-section can be determined with the shown formula. In the direction of motion, an imaginary collision volume in the form of a cylinder is obtained. If the center of gravity of a particle is within this cylinder, a collision will occur. The length of the collision cylinder corresponds to the free path lambda. The volume of the collision cylinder Vc results from the product of the collision cross-section sigma and the length of the free path lambda. In every cylindrical collision volume there is by definition just one particle, namely the particle with which the moving molecule collides. Then the molecule will change its direction and define a new collision volume, again with a target particle with which it will collide. The statement that there is only one single particle within a collision cylinder ultimately refers to the center of gravity of the particles. In general, there will be several molecules whose surface will reach into the collision volume, but only if the center of gravity is inside this cylinder will there actually be a collision. This will only be the case for one molecule, because from then on a new collision volume will be defined, until a further collision will occur. This consideration of the center of gravity also makes sense insofar as the molecules can still be imagined as mass points surrounded by a spherical collision shell so to speak. With this assumption as mass points it becomes clear that there is actually only one molecule inside a collision cylinder. How many molecules are in a certain volume can also be determined by the particle density in the gas. 
This particle density is calculated by the quotient of the total number of particles n and the entire volume of the gas V. The particle density indicates the number of particles per unit volume. If one multiplies this particle density by any volume Vc, then one obtains the number of particles Nc inside this volume. For the collision volume, this number is of course 1, so that the mean free path lambda can be determined by using this condition. In this way we obtain the given formula. The length of the mean free path is only dependent on the particle density and the diameter of the gas molecules. However, the derivation of this formula was based on resting particles. In fact, however, the individual molecules will move relative to each other. It is to be assumed that this will then lead to increased collisions per time and therefore the mean free path will be shortened. Taking into account the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution, the mean free path is then shortened by the square root of 2. The derivation of this factor is shown later in this video. For an ideal gas, the particle density marked in red can also be expressed using the thermodynamic temperature and the pressure according to the ideal gas law. In this equation, Kb denotes the Boltzmann constant. If we put this relationship into the formula for calculating the length of the mean free path, we get the shown equation. In this way, we can now calculate the mean free path as a function of temperature, pressure, and diameter of the gas molecules. If a nitrogen molecule with a diameter of about 370 picometer and a temperature of 293 kelvin and a pressure of 1 bar is considered, a mean free path of 67 nanometers results. In this case, the mean free path is about 10 times less than the wavelength of visible light. With the mean free path and the, the mean speed of the molecules, the mean time period tau between two collisions can now also be determined. This mean time indicates the repetitive time intervals in which collisions occur on average. Therefore, the reciprocal of this time period can be understood as the collision frequency f, which indicates the number of collisions per unit time. This collision frequency is often denoted by the letter z. If we use the given formula for the mean speed of the molecules and the formula for the mean free path, we can find the formula for calculating the collision frequency. We can write the given expression much simpler. However, we do not want to go into detail here about the individual steps for simplifying the formula. Pause the video to comprehend these simplifications. For the nitrogen molecule already considered at a temperature of 293 Kelvin and at a pressure of 1 bar, a collision frequency of 7 times 10 to the power of 9 Hz results. This means that within one second a single nitrogen molecule will collide on average with 7 billion other molecules. To obtain the total number of collisions per unit volume, the number of collisions must be multiplied by the particle density. It must be taken into account that two molecules always collide with each other, so that the factor of one half must be taken into account. The particle density can be expressed by the temperature and the pressure according to the already derived formula. If you use this formula for the particle density and also the formula for the collision frequency, then the total number of collisions per unit volume can be determined with the given formula. Pause the video to comprehend the simplification of the formula in detail. For nitrogen, a value of 8.7 times 10 to the power of 34 is obtained. This means that 8.7 times 10 to the power of 34 collisions occur within one second in a volume of one cubic meter. To better illustrate this unimaginably large number, here is a small example. If 100 quadrillion collisions would take place within one second, then still another 15 billion years would have to pass in order to obtain this total number of collisions. 15 billion years correspond by the way to the age of our universe. In the following, we will go into more detail on the derivation of the factor square root of 2 in the formula for the calculation of the mean free path. The starting point for the derivation of the formula without this factor was the assumption that the molecules are all at rest. In the following we will indicate those quantities which refer to this situation with the index 0. In such a case, the mean free path lambda zero can be determined as indicated by the mean speed v of the moving molecule and the mean time tau zero between two collisions. Now we imagine that the other molecules would also move with the same mean speed in a random way. What effect would this have now on the mean free path? For this purpose, we look more closely at the quantities on the right side of the equation. 
In principle, nothing changes in the mean speed, because according to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the mean speed for an ideal gas depends only on the temperature. However, we assume that the temperature is constant and therefore also the mean speed. What will change, however, is the mean time between the collisions. Because now it is no longer the case that a molecule approaches a resting particle with the mean speed, but the two colliding molecules move towards each other. So in this case, two colliding molecules approach each other much faster. Therefore, the mean time between two collisions is shortened and the mean free path is reduced accordingly. Note that the time between two collisions is not determined by the absolute speed of the molecule, but by the relative speed with which two molecules are approaching each other. Only in the special case of resting particles the relative speed is equal to the absolute speed. Let us consider the following example. In the first case, a ball moves at a speed of 3 meters per second towards a second ball at rest, which is at a distance of 15 meters. In this case, it will take 5 seconds for the balls to collide. In a figurative sense, the length of the mean free path would be equal to the distance of 15 meters. In the second case, the previously resting ball 2 now moves toward the rolling ball 1 at a speed of 2 meters per second. This consequently shortens the time to collision. From the point of view of ball 1, the second ball is now approaching at a relative speed of 5 meters per second. In this case, only 3 seconds elapse before the initial distance of 15 meters is covered. Thus, the two balls collide after only 3 seconds. At a speed of 3 meters per second, ball 1 thus covers a distance of 9 meters, which in a figurative sense corresponds to the free path. This free path has therefore been significantly shortened. This illustrative example makes it clear once again that the relative speed with which two molecules approach each other is decisive for the mean free path. So the question is not what is the mean speed of the molecules, but what is the mean relative speed between the molecules at which they approach each other. For the one-dimensional case of the two balls just considered, the relative speed is simply the difference between the two velocities. Note that the velocity of ball 2 is negative, since it is moving in the opposite direction. In principle, it does not matter whether we subtract the velocity of ball 2 from the velocity of ball 1 or vice versa. This only has an effect on the sign of the relative velocity. Since we are interested later anyway only in the relative speed, the exact order in which we subtract the velocities from each other does not play a role. We can now easily transfer the calculation of the relative velocity to the three-dimensional case of molecular motion in a gas. We determine the relative velocity of two molecules in the same way from the difference of the velocity vectors. For the sake of clarity, the magnitude of a velocity is denoted only by the symbol v without any further indication. If, on the other hand, the velocity vector is meant, then an arrow is explicitly placed above the symbol. We will now square the vector of relative velocity. At this point it is already apparent that the sign of the relative velocity and thus the order of subtraction of the velocities is of no importance, since this will lead to the same positive result in both cases. Basically it makes no difference from a mathematical point of view whether you square the magnitude of a vector or whether you square the vector itself. In both cases you get the same scalar result. The relative speed can thus be expressed as shown by the corresponding vector. If we use at this point the difference of the velocity vectors for the relative velocity vector, we get the shown relationship between the relative speed and the velocities of the individual molecules. Again, at this point we can express the squared velocity vectors by the square of the corresponding speeds. With this equation, only the relative speed of individual collisions can be determined so far. A statement about the mean relative speed is only possible if all potential collisions, with their respective velocity vectors, are considered and the mean relative speed is calculated with the formula derived so far. Since the right side of the equation is the mean value of a sum, the mean value of the individual summands can be calculated instead. Let us now take a closer look at each of the three marked terms. The first term which contains the squared speed of molecule 2, does not differ on average from the second term, which contains the squared speed of molecule 1. Due to the random motions, the mean speed of the two molecules, or rather all molecules, is identical and correspond to the mean speed according to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. 
Let's take a closer look at the third term. This term contains the scalar product of the velocity vectors. As is usual with a scalar product, the individual velocity components are multiplied by each other and then summed up. The individual components can be both negative and positive. However, since this is a completely statistical distribution of the components, positive and negative values for the scalar product are obtained to the same extent. Thus, when considering a sufficient number of molecules or collisions, on average the positive terms will compensate with the negative terms. Therefore, on statistical average, the third term in the given equation will be zero. In this way, we finally obtain the shown relationship between the mean value of the respective speed squares. At this point it makes no difference whether we consider the mean value of the speed squares or the square of the mean speeds. Because according to the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution, the mean value of the speed squares is in a constant ratio to the square of the mean speed. Of course, this also applies to the relative speed, because a gas does not change its temperature just because it is described from the point of view of relative motion. More information about this can be found in the video about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We now see that the mean relative speed with which two molecules approach each other is equal to the mean speed of the molecules multiplied by the square root of 2. Thus, the actual approach speed of two molecules is greater than if only their own speed were taken as a basis for the approach, this would correspond to the case that all other molecules were at rest. Compared to the situation in which all molecules are at rest, the time between two collisions is shortened by exactly the factor square root of 2 due to the higher approach speed. The mean free path becomes shorter to the same extent. At the end we would like to check the derived relationship between the mean relative speed and the mean speed of the molecules in a relatively simple way with the help of an Excel spreadsheet. For this purpose, we create a table with a total of 10,000 rows. Each row represents one molecule. To each of these molecules, we assign a random velocity component in x, y, and z direction. This is done by a random number resulting from a normal distribution. For each molecule, we first calculate the absolute speed. To do this, we square the individual components, then sum them up, and then calculate the square root. Now we determine the relative speed between a molecule and the following molecule. To do this, we square the difference in the respective velocity components, then add them up, and then calculate the square root. Next, we calculate the mean value of the speeds of the molecules, as well as the mean value of the relative speed. We now see that the mean relative speed corresponds exactly to the square root of 2, times the mean speed of the molecules. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.